Very excited. I'm Brennan Donilon. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. And we are really pleased to offer uh, a, a great webinar today, good information from our longtime partners at Veritex, uh, the court reporting company that has long time been a supporter of our bar. And they're here uh, to support you to talk about remote depositions and with a free offer. So um, I'm going to toss, pass it on to uh, Nick Ranillo. Karen Patterson is also with us. But Nick, why don't you take it away? So thank you very much, Brendan. Greatly appreciate it. Very uh, excited uh, to have the uh, opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, this is my uh, first time doing a live uh, stream on Facebook. So uh, uh, exciting on, on another level there. Uh, so again, thank you very much for the opportunity and appreciate those who have uh, taken the time to log on and uh, hopefully we can field any questions you have. If you have had a chance to watch uh, the video link, that is wonderful as well. Uh, and there's a, 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 just a plethora of uh, collateral on uh, Veritex.com remote uh, that talks uh, about uh, remote deposition and the process kind of top to bottom. Uh, so I, I would direct you there for any additional information uh, as well, but uh, obviously ha happy to take any questions live. Uh, joining me today is my colleague, Karen Patterson, uh, as well. Uh, Karen has been uh, in the court reporting profession uh, for a uh, number of years. I won't uh, give the uh, precise number. Uh, no, please that don't. Wouldn't be, uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be, wouldn't be polite, maybe, in some forms, but uh, uh, Karen and I have worked together for uh, uh, the better part of almost 15 years now, uh, and this is a very interesting time in, in the profession. Uh, the legal profession as a whole, I guess, you know, kind of in, in the world as a whole as well. Um, but the reality of it is that we all need to continue forward and keep doing business. Uh, and we think there's a number of avenues to do that. One of those is kind of shifting your uh, deposition process to a remote uh, platform. Um, you know, there's been a lot in the press uh, the past several weeks about security uh, related to uh, some specific remote platforms. And uh, I, I think you really can, uh, number one, rest assured that uh, these platforms are fully secure. The Bar Association wouldn't be utilizing uh, the Zoom platform uh, for, uh, I think, you know, I mean, I, Brennan, I heard the set number like, you know, 67 seminars that you guys have conducted uh, over the past three-week three, three week period uh, with a lot of different legal topics uh, in a secure environment. So uh, I think you can be assured that that is off the table. So you unmuted. How many have you done thus far? How many have we done thus far? I, I can't say we've done 60, but I think we've done in excess of 20 since uh, yeah. 20 with a COVID-19 theme since, since this whole okay. crisis really escalated. So, uh, you know, again, back to the bar, using it as a secure platform. Um, you know, everything is, is fully encrypted on um, any of these remote platforms. Uh, you know, Veritex uh, utilizes um, a platform through remote counsel, which utilizes a Zoom overlay to that as well. Uh, and it is 256K encrypted and point-to-point -point encrypted as well. Um, I think part of the kind of the key process, and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of jump in here a little bit more, but uh, is all in the preparation and getting everything set up as much in advance uh, as you can. We all know that uh, litigation can be very last minute and uh, you're often getting prepared for a deposition, uh, you know, the morning of or just prior to the deposition, even uh, prepping your exhibit. So uh, that is one kind of critical component that you do need to consider if you're going to go with a remote deposition, um, you know, to chance to give or chance yourself to connect in advance, to um, think about your exhibits, how you're going to handle them, whether you're going to utilize uh, a paper process, uh, which might be a scenario where you're uh, putting the exhibits and shipping them one to the witness, one to opposing counsel, and one to the court reporter, uh, all in sealed envelopes that they open up live on the camera and allow the court reporter to mark it. Or if you're going to do um, a um, shared desktop type process, whether you're sharing the exhibit or the uh, court reporter is actually managing that exhibit, how do you get those exhibits either to the court reporter uh, prior with a secure link, uh, and if you're going to present those exhibits yourself, how do you get them post deposition to the report of this secure link? Uh, I see we have a chat question popping up here. I think that's well within my uh, right to click on the chat here. Uh, I have a question. Can you post them uh, in the Q&A area or post them right here? 
Nick, that was just me. Um, I was just oh, encouraging oh, our panelists. Oh, oh to post. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for encouraging the panel. Sorry. Okay, I'll get back yeah, on track. Not panelists, participants. Uh, but. Yeah. So yeah, please please chat or uh, uh, chime in live uh, with the chat or chat with us. Um, you know, or al alternatively, using a uh, an exhibit present presenter. Uh, Veritex is a product called Exhibit Share, which is uh, a web-based application that uh, will allow uh, an attorney or uh, legal assistant or paralegal to present the exhibits live during the deposition in a separate web browser. Uh, and the opposing counsel and witness can log into a separate browser from their location and see what is being presented. Those exhibits uh, are marked live uh, on the screen as it's happening. So putting an exhibit number on it, the witness has the ability to scroll up and down and, and really get very interactive uh, with the exhibit as well. Uh, and I think that's probably what we're finding is the uh, largest impediment to people uh, moving forward with remote depositions is how do I handle the exhibits? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I can tell you is there's a, a multitude of ways to handle it and we've uh, become very adept over the past several weeks of advising clients on what the best approach is and how, how to handle your uh, exhibits. Karen, would you like to add anything more at that point? Well, I, that's the biggest question that I've been getting from clients, and that's the biggest thing that they want to see is how do, how do we handle exhibits? And, you know, we sent out that webinar. I don't know how many people have had a chance to watch it. It does cover the exhibits. And people feel like after that webinar, they're all set. And then I get calls, oh my gosh, I just got the link, how do I do this? So there is a, a, you know, an anxiety factor, but I will tell you that Exhibit Share, the product that we use to, to share the exhibits on the screen is super, super simple. It's not to be feared. Um, you can use any kind of file format with it. It marks your exhibits. The exhibits become part of the transcript. It's really just a great feature. But if anybody would like to see a private demo, email me. I put my email on the chat feature. I would love to send you all our best practices guide that has a ton of tutorials in it. Um, but yes, the exhibit is the exhibits are the biggest concern of any attorney that I talk with. And I will tell you too that we've had depositions with 30 some attorneys in it and they've been using exhibit share successfully. And they, after their first deposition, they become very, very comfortable with it. So definitely not to be feared, simple, it's easy, and we can hold your hand through the whole process. Yeah, you know, and, and some of the thoughts we give around that are, you know, the, the best practices going in, um, you know, obviously, you know, log on as, or, or, you know, test and practice uh, as much as you can. We have uh, demo sites available for people to log in privately um and they can practice with these tools prior to the deposition uh and that even goes for the zoom platform uh through virtual three we can set those up in advance and allow people a chance to um uh, test the product see what it's like um you know it, i think a number of people have been on zooms uh, you know more more than you ever imagined uh over the past several days so that really is somewhat been removed from uh, the concern of, of connecting and, and speaking and being visual online. Uh, you know, I would encourage if you're going to do any type of deposition that all counsel will be in agreement that everyone has to be visual on the camera, that uh, it makes it obviously much easier for the reporter to get a record. And I think it makes a, a clear pit playing field. And I, I think that goes a little bit to what, uh, you know, part of that, that, that pre uh, deposition prep, you know, separate apart from, you know, well, how are you going to handle your exhibits? Um, you know, but also lay, kind of laying the ground rules for the deposition, getting agreement amongst all parties. We're all going to be on the screen. We've all shared our, our cell phone numbers. Should there be a technical difficulty that we can uh, contact someone, uh, identify, you know, the person that's kind of, if there is technical difficulties, there is a 800 number, uh, which is direct support that you can call. Um, if the court reporter just gets connected, we all agree we'll stop because if there's not a written record, uh, we all know it didn't happen. So these are just uh, you know a handful of the things that I, I kind of put out there that I think are, are good to talk about. Um, I think we've all been on cell phone conversations where you're trying to interrupt uh, the person on the other end and they're they're talking and they can't hear you. That's the same thing with these remote depositions. Uh, you know, so definitely a good practice. Um, you know, finish the question, pause, allow opposing counsel maybe to put an objection in, and then allow the witness to answer. So if you set those up. 
uh, and very clean ground rules. And, you know, we have a bunch of standard stipulations and along with standard notice language to incorporate um, into the, the, the beginning part of the deposition, just so everything's on the record and it's clean and clear. And I think if you go in thinking uh, with that kind of mindset, it really kind of sets you up for a successful remote deposition and allows you to, you know, uh, conduct your, your deposition, get the testimony you need to elicit. Uh, and frankly, at this point, allows your cases to move forward. I've, uh, uh, and a, a number of uh, comments were made um, uh, through a number of seminars I've been attending that, uh, you know, litigation has seemed to have stalled and, you know, a lot of um, plaintiff's attorneys and defense guys are kind of uh, maybe in a little bit of a, a, a deadlock, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, but there's no reason that should be the case. I think you definitely can uh, move forward, conduct a deposition, have uh, a productive um, outcome uh, in these remote settings. I think the, the interesting thing we're seeing uh, at Veritex is it's not the the ones that are happening are not the smaller depositions. They're actually in, a, uh, in, in one scenario a lot more of the complex depositions, experts that have to get done, witnesses that need to be taken because trial dates are in September, October, November, and they don't have the luxury of waiting for the court to maybe move it or stay it. So they're moving forward. So the jobs that we're doing are all day. They are real time. They are rough draft. They are expedited. They are hundreds of exhibits being shown, uh, which is kind of, uh, I guess, if you'd asked me, uh, uh, you know, going into this uh, pandemic or, uh, you know, situation previously, what we do, oh, you know, the basic depositions are going to happen remotely because that's kind of where we've always positioned this remote world is, you know, if you don't want to, you know, travel for a, a basic fact witness, uh, you know, three hour plane ride to, you know, to, to the West coast and take a fact witness and fly back. Well, we have this great remote solution. Now we're kind of seeing, this is great for an eight hour uh, expert that there's 30 people logged on and, and uh, complex nature of the deposition. Okay. okay. No, I, I agree in that the best practices guide, I highly recommend it. It covers all of this um, material and um, it, it's, it's been successful. I hate to say it, but I think, you know, as lawyers kind of get nudged into having to do this, it, it, it's going to, I really believe that it'll become the norm. It's going to be our new normal. Um, the equipment needed, that is very basic as well. Uh, a computer with a webcam, a telephone connection, and either Wi-Fi or hardwire internet connection, which I would recommend hardwire if you have, um, you know, kids at home that are on the internet during the day doing their schoolwork, etc. But it does work, and we also recommend using a telephone, your iPhone, your Android, whatever it is, for sound, for the court reporter, and in case you should happen to get bumped off the video, you will still have the sound. Um, depositions can be videotaped as well. It's not the traditional videotape method, but it is the same deliverable that you would get with the traditional videotape method. We just use a little bit different technology. Um, I would love to hear questions from participants that um, might be a little reluctant to use the, the, um, the technology for remote depositions. And I also want them to know that if they would like a live demo to actually be in the Zoom room and actually see exhibits being shared, I'm here for that as well. I can set that up. Um, something I, I will add there quickly. So I was doing a, a client demonstration yesterday and, um, you know, as part of best practice, I was uh, on my cell phone yet uh, visually on the screen uh, and my power went out of my house just randomly. Yeah. Uh, so my, my image froze. I actually reverted right over to my iPad, which has a Zoom application and has a cellular signal. And within literally 35 seconds, I was back on the presentation visually and they never had lost, I never lost connectivity because I was on my cell phone uh, speaking to the group and went right back on my image appeared live again. So there is, um, um, uh, and I, I bring that up for two reasons. A, how seamless it was to switch over with connectivity and B, um, it works very functionally well uh, on iPads or on smartphones. We've had a number of witnesses uh, handle this on smartphones um, because they don't have access to a computer or you know they're just not technical uh, enough to do that. And it's worked pretty well from that level. Hey Nick, I'd like to interject. I, I have a question. I'm, um, 
a lot of what you're talking about doesn't sound like it's happened in the last four or six weeks. It seems like you've had, you've been working out the kinks and making sure this technology is reliable since way before COVID, right? Well, so that, I, I said this, you know, we've been talking about this for five years and no one wanted to listen. Uh, and now, you know, <laughs> uh, in part, people are finally listening to us a little bit. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, I think I've had, I got a power, you know, uh, the exhibit share product that frankly we've been referencing, the, the first version launched in 2017 uh, on that product. Uh, we had our first remote deposition uh, product over five years ago built on an Adobe Connect platform, which is still a platform we're utilizing as, as another alternative uh, for those that aren't comfortable with the virtual three remote console Zoom platform. We have an Adobe based platform uh, that allows you to uh, uh, just, you know, still same, similar type access, just not on that platform, um, you know, and uh, additionally, you know, we have uh, real-time feeds are integrated into all those uh, and available along with the exhibits as well. But yeah, thank you for that question. Yes, we've been okay. doing this, we've doing, been doing this for a while. Yeah. Any other questions from participants? Uh, we've not received any questions so far. I'm encouraging them on Facebook. I know we have um, quite a few people watching. So uh, if you do have questions, now's the time to get them answered. Um, it, it's really, I think, would you agree that, you know, even when we are clear of this pandemic and we all hope for that to happen soon, um, this is going to change the way a lot of businesses and, and especially the legal industry use technology, right? Oh, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think this is, like I said, we're, we're all, all of us, you know, all of us working from home, we're all kind of getting forced into this remote world. And as people become more comfortable with it, they're going to be using it instead of you know, spending the money on travel. Um, yeah, it's going to become, I believe, absolutely comfortable and normal. Yeah, you, you know, Ver, Ver, I always kind of, Veritex was a very in-office company. We kind of felt like you know, everyone had to be in the same location, the calendars, the client services team, the, 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 the litigation support people, the product people. And uh, I think we found that, uh, wow, we're actually doing pretty well, uh, all of us working in individually, uh, individual locations and communicating with each other. Uh, and I think a lot of law firms in, in the legal world is experiencing that as well. Uh, and that, you know, you can be productive. And I think probably a lot of us are probably working more hours uh, that, that we were previously uh, yeah. with our home offices. You know, I know I finished breakfast at 8.05 and I'm at my uh, desk at 8.05 at 37 seconds. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. so we're really putting in full days here. Uh, and I, I do think, you know, maybe this will lead to, um, you know, looking at how, how you litigate your cases. And maybe if you have three or four or five fact witnesses where you might have gone uh, and set up five different days for five different uh, depositions that you might line them up uh, sequentially via a, a remote platform and, uh, you know, address them one, two, three, four, five, uh, and make yourself more of an, an efficient uh, litigator in your cases. And, you know, I think you can utilize uh, a lot of different technologies to do that, but, you know, maybe the platform like this is one of them. You know, uh, un, you know whether people uh, are fully aware or not, we are experiencing a shortage of court reporters uh, in this country, and we're looking at a lot of alternative methods of capture. Uh, from a digital reporting standpoint, but also just utilizing our traditional court reporters in a much more efficient manner. Uh, and if you can, you know, have a court reporter reserved all day uh, and take, you know, three, four or five depositions, that's a very efficient use of the time. It doesn't put uh, the litigator situation where they might be told, you know, we just don't have a court reporter uh, available because, you know, look, the reality of litigation is not going away. It's uh, on the in increase. And I think we're going to see a, a, a spike uh, in a lot of litigation um, after the, p the pandemic, uh, you know, kind of we go back to uh, oh, yeah. regular, you know, societal operations. I think I saw this morning, uh, you know, kind of the first um, business interruption insurance uh, denial uh, suits were filed this morning uh, in the state for uh, denial of some uh, interruption insurance. So there's going to be a spike there. But, you know, again, being efficient with those and, and trying to take, uh, utilize technology to uh, move the process along. Nick, I have a question that came in from a Facebook Live user, and it says, um, can you talk a little more, more about security in video depositions? Is there any cause for concern about hackers? 
you know, so the, the, the hack that people, uh, you know, was very well publicized on Zoom related to uh, a unpaid accounts. They were the free Zoom version and people were posting their uh, meeting IDs on social media sites uh, and not uh, utilizing best practices around, uh, you know, their, their uh, utilization of, the, of those Zoom accounts. Um, you know, everything for us is authenticated against uh, email address. It is single user sign on. There is also an embedded password within that email address. Uh, so if you're to forward it on, it's not authentic it's password. It's going to uh, trigger a, you're not an authenticated uh, email address, and we're going to need uh, the password associated with you. We also have another layer in terms of admitting people into um, the virtual deposition where uh, the host is saying, okay, this person is permitted to come in. This is not a registered user for this, so you can decline uh, their entry. There's also ways to control um the meeting in terms of exiting people if uh you know someone is uh shouldn't you know shouldn't be there uh but got in under the guys you can uh, remove them from the meeting uh again i did reference it is point to point connect uh, secure connectivity on uh, a 256k encryption so uh look I, I mean we have a white paper uh that we produce related to the zoom matter uh zoom has produced a number of um publications related to it um i can tell you we were on a call at Veritex with the CEO of Zoom uh, last week, and he is hosting weekly calls now. Uh, Zoom has put aside any other type of development uh, for the next three months and is solely focusing right now uh, on um, getting people to understand the secure nature of their platform uh, and what they have. So I really think there's there's no no, uh, no 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 need for concern around the security with the platform. Okay, Nick, uh, we have a question from Lisa Reed, one of our uh, audience members, and it says, uh, could you please explain the court reporter shortage that you mentioned? So, um, you know, the, the, about a report was published back in 2014, kind of when this became on the radar. Uh, and, um, you know, the reality of it is, is that we just were not filling the schools and court reporters were not entering the profession. Uh, the average age of a court reporter right now is somewhere in the range of about 55, uh, and that uh, part of the workforce is beginning to retire. So we're seeing a, a large number of retirements within the profession, and frankly, there just is not that uh, pipeline of new reporters coming into the profession. I can tell you in the state of California, as an example, last year alone, nine people passed their uh, state certification and 3,000 lawyers passed the bar exam. So uh, there's a huge discrepancy in terms of the number of reporters completing school and versus the number uh, that are actually coming out and actively reporting. The other, you know, uh, reality of it is, is that, it, you, know, uh, you know, just like a, a young attorney coming into a firm, you know, they're not ready to take the complex uh, case right off the bat. They start with, you know, smaller fact witnesses and basic depositions and work their way up. Uh, even if we were to get a large influx of court reporters right now, it'd be a number of years before they were even at a level to take a lot of the depositions that are out there in a lot of the complex cases, because they simply don't have, haven't developed the skills and the, and the dictionary and the writing abilities to reach that level. Uh, I'll actually defer this over to Karen Patterson, who actually is a court reporter, so she's probably even yeah. uh, more well positioned to answer that question. So yeah, I was a court reporter for many, many years before I um, transferred you know, transitioned into the position that I'm in right now. And I taught it as well at a local community college. And I will tell you, it's a very difficult profession. It's very difficult to learn. It requires financial investment and it requires a ton of time for practice. It's like learning an instrument. Um, it is really an art. And I would say out of a claim, this has been standard throughout my time in the profession, if you have a class of 30 students and you graduate one or two that go on to pass the National Court Reporter Association um, test to qualify you to become a court reporter, one or two out of a class of 30 is a lot. So there's a huge attrition rate in it. It's very difficult. And I think that um, now people young people coming out of high school, going into college, they're looking at that and saying, you know, I don't know that I want to spend that kind of time learning that profession. So it's an evolution, just like when I started in the profession, there were a few pen writers left. And just like Brennan and I were talking before the um, um, 
um, discussion here today that there were different, there were people with masks that put them on and repeated what people said in the room. So there's been a number of different iterations of court reporters. And I think that right now we're just kind of heading into the new iteration of a digital reporter, which is actually a very great and accurate capture method. So we are still uh, big proponents of stenographic reporters. We're trying to get them into schools. We're doing fundraisers to um, grant scholarships to them. But again, as Nick said, it's going to take those new reporters coming in several years. It's like another four years of education in order to get up to speed to go take an expert deposition or, um, you know, a medical deposition, medical case. So it's, it's, it's always been tough getting graduates. And it's more tough now. Uh, we have another question from Facebook. Um, says you may have touched upon this before I joined. Um, but how are exhibits being dealt with? I know we did talk about um, the exhibit yeah. display, but maybe we can we can circle back around to that for Mark. Yeah, ha ha happy to do that, Mark. You know, so exhibits are being dealt with in a, in a number of different manners. Uh, there, yeah, we have a process that we can suggest related to the paper in terms of, uh, you know, shipping the exhibits in advance to all the appropriate uh, parties in the court reporter, uh, leaving them in sealed envelopes with maybe, you know, one through 10 labeled on the envelopes. Uh, you know, open them up live on on a, on a camera feed, and and so you can assure that they weren't uh, looking at the exhibits in advance. Um, and uh, you know, that's a potentially a paper alternative. We have a shared uh, desktop scenario that you could utilize uh, in Zoom in terms of, uh, you know, the attorney just presenting them on a shared uh, desktop, showing them to the witness and and opposing counsel, and speaking about them uh, and questioning from them, and then you know, under that same kind of platform. Uh, you could have the court reporter uh, also presenting the exhibits for the room. Uh, there's got to be, again, I, I talked about some best practices about, you know, rules of conduct. If the court reporter is presenting them, you need to be mindful that their hands are off the stenographic keyboard and on the computer keyboard. So you can't uh, be questioning right away. You have to allow the court reporter to be prepared if they're going to present the exhibits and uh, take the testimony. And third would be a remote uh, exhibit uh, solution. Uh, whether, you know, Veritex's product is called the Exhibit Share, a number of other companies out there have uh, their own exhibit solutions, but it would be a web-based application where uh, you'd essentially have a private folder and move them into a public folder um, uh, via a website, and everyone will be logged into that site and be able to see those exhibits at that time. Um, um, go, go ahead, Nick. No, no, I just, I know, I saw the question there, yeah, so I had a question about uh, Adobe Connect as well. Yes, um, yes. From Mark. Yeah. So uh, Adobe was, a, was a, you know, kind of our uh, uh, 1.0 product for remote depositions. Uh, we're still supporting the Adobe platform. It's through something called Adobe Connect. Uh, why we really liked Adobe Connect, and uh, again, Zoom wasn't in existence when, uh, uh, or at least mainstreamed when we uh, went into this, you know, five or six years ago. Uh, you know, everyone seemed to have an, has, seems to have an Adobe viewer uh, to view PDFs on their uh, computer and, and that uh, you know law firms certainly have have had a very locked down uh, network in terms of adding um, you know widgets or anything and downloading anything uh, to the attorney's desktop. So uh, we utilized the Adobe Connect platform because everyone had a PDF viewer, which simply allowed for you to connect via this uh, remote platform. Uh, it works very well. Um, I would tell you that product was designed as what I would refer to as a desktop solution, meaning that you were kind of sitting at your desk, you were plugged into your wired network, um, and you had a telephone, and you were, you know, uh, the phone audio was synced up with the video signal, so uh, it was much more of a desktop solution. Uh, why we've kind of pushed into, you know, the, the, the virtual three uh, remote console Zoom platform, it deals with bandwidth uh, much better than the uh, Adobe product did. Uh, Adobe really somewhat required a wired uh, hard connection uh, where Zoom handles uh, compression rate on uh, Wi-Fi signals uh, considerably better. Uh, but yeah, both, again, still two products. We offer them both. Uh, the Adobe product is very stable, um, but just an alternative. Uh, and, you know, obviously with the Zoom uh, press, we are, uh, you know, setting up a lot more Adobe's than we were previously as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I can share with you, we're doing several hundred remote depositions a day. Uh, right now across the country. So this is not, uh, uh, you know, three or four or five or 10 uh, getting conducted. It's a definitely uh, a, a viable option. And Mark, since, 
Mark, since you joined late, if you want to send me your email address, I'll send you a best practice guide that covers all of this um, for you. It's got a ton of information, videos, etc. Okay, I'm going to say um, maybe last call for questions, and we'll stay as long as folks have questions to answer. But be, as, as we're waiting for those questions, I know you have um, a free offer that you wanted to discuss. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Right. So during the COVID-19 crisis, we are offering free remote connections for all participants in any deposition or proceeding. That The normal cost for that is $495 per day for the, initial, for the initiating party and the bar and location. So that is offered free. So it's a great time to take advantage, try it out, even if you have a small deposition or, you know, even a meeting, um, give it a try. It is free. Yeah, and, and I think that meeting, meeting is a, a good point of reference, Karen. You know, uh, you know, we, we always talk to, you know, if you have an expert or someone in another city that you, you know, maybe you're considering just using the expert and you haven't uh, right. uh, ever met them before and you want to get eyes on to see if, you know, this is someone that could, you know, potentially present well, if you think this case is ultimately going to, uh, you know, end up in, in trials, this guy going to present well live for a jury. Uh, it's a good way to just, uh, uh, you know, get eyes on and meet with people as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Nick or Karen, do you have any anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Um, the only thing that I would add is give it a try. It really is a lot more, it's simpler than you think. It is effective. <laughs> And we know it's not like live, but it does get the job done. So don't, you know, don't hesitate. I'm here for you. Nick is here for you. Reach out to us. We'll help you. Okay. Well, um, Nick Ranillo, Karen Patterson from Veritext. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who uh, attended and participated today. We had some good questions. And um, as Karen said, I'll say one more time, if you email uh, kpatterson at veritex.com, she can send you uh, that best practices guide and a lot more information. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone has a good afternoon and, and um, thanks for attending and, and please stay healthy. Thanks, Brennan. Brennan. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.